Spoilers! If you haven't seen the first episode of Prehistoric Planet and care about being spoiled about the inclusion of some critters, stay away from this video till you've seen it. This video was made by using my own knowledge, scientific papers, as well as the words of the people involved with the show itself. This is in no way meant to provide undue criticism towards the hard work that went into the show. In fact, there are very little instances where it may come off as me saying that something is wrong. As I am not an expert on every single group of animals, living or extinct, I used the words of other experts that may know the given organism better than I. Many criticisms are merely nitpicking and do not affect the quality of the overall show, and many are also debatable. I used the words provided by lead paleontological consultant Dr. Darren Nash via his Twitter threads discussing the designs and design philosophy of all the animals in Prehistoric Planet to construct a more fleshed out scientific discussion than the show provides. Obviously, the show is meant to be more visual and myth-breaking or trope-busting than purely informational or educational. It does deliver a good amount of scientific information, but only that which is absolutely needed in the context of the scene or episode. I think a lot of people wanted more thorough explanations of why some animals were reconstructed the way they were, especially considering how strongly updated they are with speculative but scientifically rooted displays, behaviors, and tissues because of the stranglehold the 80s and 90s nostalgia-fueled outdated reconstructions have on most dinosaur-related media. So, please take all this into consideration when watching my scientific reviews of Prehistoric Planet. I was not aware of any information that may come out after the writing, recording, editing, or publication of these videos that may counter any issues I bring up with the dinosaurs of Prehistoric Planet. As of the writing of this preamble, no full-length documentaries or discussion of the behind-the-scenes work on the series has come out. Some rather short tidbits on the location filming, philosophy, and computer animation work have been released, but this does not entail the full breadth of the project. Turangisaurus Design the next animal to show up is the Turiangisaurus. This is an elasmosaurid plesiosaur from New Zealand. Though of course when it was alive it did not live on New Zealand nor is it impossible that they swam to other locations. The neck flexibility of these animals has been in question over the years. The most recent work suggests they had quite a bit of neck flexion as in early paleoart depictions giving them swan-like necks. However, they probably kept their necks in a more horizontal posture when at rest. Their necks were heavily muscled and not floppy or noodle-like. These guys are given a nice layer of fat to keep them warm and a small fin on the end of their short tails, as has been hypothesized in recent years. They are given a basic bluish color scheme with rather faint horizontal striping. It may have made some sense to give them a lightly colored belly to reflect the idea that many marine reptiles had countershading, like most huge modern ocean animals today. Then again, that color contrast is more common among marine animals that spend most of their time in deeper water. Behavior The first segment with the Turiangisaurus depicts them swallowing ballast stones or gastroliths. The narration tells us they use them for ballast but also to help grind up their food since they lack the ability to chew up their food before swallowing. Gastroliths have been associated with plenty of extinct organisms through the years, but nowhere are they found as consistently in association with skeletons as in the plesiosaurs. Much to my surprise. At this point, it is a verifiable fact these animals were swallowing stones in large numbers, even if an exact function has yet to be proven. Gastroliths really only have a few uses, so it's not hard to figure out here in the case of the plesiosaurs, but you know, it's still difficult to say for certain. The Turiangisaurus come back in a second sequence in this episode, in which a mother and calf are swimming along with their pod, when they are set upon by a medium-sized Antarctic and potentially New Zealand Mosasaur, Kaikaifalu. 
In this sequence, the calf distracts the predator by nipping and biting it so the mother can get away to the safety of the pod. This is behavior we see today in many marine mammals. It can be inferred to be possible for these marine reptiles due to the kinds of babies they had. A few adult specimens have been found pregnant with live young. These animals did not lay eggs. A few of these specimens preserve an absolutely enormous calf. The one in the show is said to be 10 feet 3 meters, making it proportionally the largest baby of any animal ever. Such a large baby suggests a lot of parental investment in the development of the calf, which suggests some level of sociality among the plesiosaurs. As such, the calf trying to save the mother and the pod coming to help is not at all implausible, nor impossible, though pretty much impossible to directly prove from fossils. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Ray, Isaiah Garza, Dinosaur, Christoph Hubinger, Biotaverse, and Arda Bayer. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, The Dogman, Iron Bladesman, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.